seems a bit like everyone is talking about SPACs right now. And in this video, I will also talk about SPACs. I will tell you what a SPAC is, and then I will discuss three competition law aspects to keep in mind when working on SPAC transactions. A SPAC, which stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Company, is a company that has been listed on the stock exchange but that has no actual business activities. It's basically an empty company that is designed to gather money from investors in an IPO, whereupon it has around two years to find a private target company to acquire with the investor's money. In other words, the whole special purpose of the SPAC is to take a private company public with the help of money from public investors. The SPAC works like a mystery box for investors because the investors get to buy stock in a yet to be determined company but if an investor doesn't like what's inside the mystery box in other words if it doesn't like the target company identified by the SPAC then the investor can withdraw from the SPAC and get its investment back with interest. Also if the SPAC fails to identify a target company within its allocated time window then the SPAC is liquidated and the investors get their money back. So why is there a need for this weird mystery box investment form? To answer that, let's look at who is expecting to benefit from SPAC setups. First of all, private companies that wishes to become public may see SPACs as a convenient way to achieve that goal. Supposedly, it's cheaper, easier and quicker for a private company to become public by being bought by a SPAC compared to having to do a traditional IPO. Therefore, SPACs may offer companies a shortcut to the funds and the prestige that normally comes only with a traditional IPO. Secondly, also private equity firms that need to exit leveraged investments in private companies may appreciate that SPAC can facilitate rapid exits. Third, the stock exchanges themselves love SPACs. A stock exchange makes money on companies being listed on their exchange, and to help facilitate SPAC transactions, most stock exchanges are now expediting rule changes to allow SPAC setups. Fourth, anything that increases the transactional activity makes the consultants happy. Therefore, bankers, accountants, and lawyers all all seem to love SPACs. Overall, it's clear that many hope to make money on SPACs, which seem to indicate that SPACs are here to stay. So I'm a competition lawyer. Why am I talking about SPACs? Well, because there are at least three competition law aspects of SPACs that I think that we should be discussing. First of all, the collusion risk. The whole purpose of a SPAC is to find a private target company to acquire, but a SPAC cannot decide before it has been formed which target company it will be. This means that if a bunch of different SPACs are set up, then all of these SPACs will to some extent be competing with each other in their hunt for suitable target companies. And as with competition in any market, the starting point is that the different SPACs cannot implicitly or explicitly collude to limit this competition. If a lot of SPACs are created, which has been the case in the US for example, then there will be a corresponding high demand for private companies to buy. If this demand cannot be met by the available supply of target companies, then this may lead to an increased risk of collusion between the SPACs. For example, the SPACs allocating target companies between themselves or rigging bids to keep purchase prices down. Furthermore, the sponsors that create the SPACs and that are responsible for finding target companies may suffer both financial and reputational losses if the SPACs fail to find a target company and must be liquidated. Therefore, SPAC sponsors have strong incentives to make sure that an acquisition is made before time runs out and the SPAC self-destructs. This pressure on sponsors to close a deal may further increase the risk of collusion between SPACs. Another risk I would like to highlight is the due diligence risk. In M&A transactions at traditional IPOs, the buyer or the underwriter normally conducts a rigorous legal due diligence process on the company. It also happens that such due diligence processes do reveal significant legal risks, including past or ongoing competition law infringements. Competition law infringements can lead to significant fines and exposure to damage claims. The ECJ has also recently confirmed that also financial investors in some situations can be liable for infringements by its portfolio companies. This is why thorough due diligence is so important. If competition law risks are identified already during a due diligence process, it is sometimes possible to handle the more serious legal risks before the transaction takes place. SPACs also conduct legal due diligence on its potential target companies, but given the financial and reputational pressure on the SPAC sponsor to close a deal within a very short time window, there is a risk that the SPAC's due diligence process is not as thorough as for traditional M&A or IPO transactions. Needless to say, no matter how thorough a due diligence process is, it can never be guaranteed that it will identify all potential legal risks. 
and competition law infringements can be particularly difficult to identify, but since legal liabilities can significantly affect the valuation of a target company, a wise goal should be to leave as few stones unturned as possible. A third risk I would like to highlight is the merger control risk. In most jurisdictions, competition law merger filing obligations arise when there is a change in the control of a company. Many times traditional IPOs do not lead to such changes of control and therefore do not trigger merger filing obligations. But this must always be considered on a case-to-case -case basis, taking into account the regulations in each relevant jurisdiction. Ultimately, the assessment of filing obligations often comes down to questions of influence among the owners post-transaction. And this analysis of post-transaction influence is no less crucial for SPAC transactions than they are for traditional IPOs and all other transactions. As an example, if one of the SPAC investors, or the sponsor for that matter, would be considered to control the SPAC, and therefore would also be considered to control the target company that the SPAC acquires, then the acquisition of the target company could entail merger filing obligations, and such obligations could completely ruin the SPAC investment timetable. It would also be necessary to consider if there are any overlaps or vertical links between the identified target company and the entity that is controlling the SPAC, including that entity's other portfolio companies. Furthermore, in some jurisdictions, also acquisitions of minority shareholdings or partial interests in various competing firms can trigger filing obligations or other regulatory scrutiny. To conclude, these three risks are not new and not really unique to SPAC transactions, and they can be mitigated. But, when a new business trend is billed as quicker, cheaper and easier, then it is usually necessary to highlight that, no matter how hyped a business trend is, also old risks must be taken into account. If you have any comments on these competition law questions, or if you want to discuss, please reach out. I would love to hear from you. Have a great day.